Okay, I think we're possibly all here. We are going to stick to time today because, as we know, we can talk a little bit long and, and then the day gets away from us. So we'll make sure that we do stick with our very carefully planned program. I'd like to welcome you all to the pre-conference workshop for 2018 and thank you for coming along today. Um, my name's Amanda Heffernan. I'm your early career researcher representative on the AARE executive. And um, Michelle Jeffries is my partner in not crime, partner in <laughs> educational research. <laughs> um, and she has actually asked me to send her apologies on because she can't be here today. So she's very disappointed, um, but she is unfortunately on medical leave, so she's not able to make it to Sydney. But we have um, together spent the last 11 months, 12 months now, um, planning this program for you. And so what we're hoping... Um, you'll find today is a space for us to talk about the different ways we can make academia and education research work for us. So there's, um, we have lots of different contexts, we have lots of different needs, we're at different points in our research, our writing, our thinking, our careers. So we're hoping that um, of, the, of the, the workshops that you've chosen today and of our wonderful presenters, um, that you will be able to take away some things that will help you navigate your way through this maze of research and work that we do together. Um, we did have icebreaker bingo. Did anyone get a bingo line? Did anyone write a single name on the card? <laughs> oh, yes. The one person I specifically spoke to about it today did it. So, oh, okay, fantastic. Thank you. So the reason we did that was because the feedback from the last workshop was that people really wanted a chance to um, get to speak to each other and to, to, to network with new people. But we were just saying that there have been some really lovely conversations and discussions happening already this morning. So hopefully um, those will continue throughout the day. If you do manage to continue um, with that bingo card, though, there are prizes in the form of post-its because we know our audience very well. <laughs> so <laughs> if you do manage to get a line, please do come and see me and um, we'll be able to give you those. So we're going to start off our, our morning today um, with a welcome to country from Uncle Ray Davidson. So I'd like to introduce him and thank him for coming along to um, get our day started. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, actually, getting up then was a little bit easier than I, I thought it was going to be, just to explain quickly. Um, my name's Uncle Ray Davison. I'm here this morning on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council. The Lands Council and its members being the custodians to the clan groups of the Eora Nation give me permission today to come along and welcome you all to country. Uh, just getting here this morning now, I've got, I've got to, um, I, I, I can't help it. Each and every time I have an uh, opportunity to give welcome to country, I love expressing to the people that I'm talking to the importance of it and what it means. And, that it encompasses all Australians, so it'll be no different today. Um, well, as I speak, I speak to everyone here in the room. Uh, and it's every opportunity I do get to uh, give welcome to country, it's really special and unique, and I look at it that way, that um, it's a real uh, special privilege to have the opportunity to stand before any given group of people and uh, welcome them to country. It's been a journey getting here this morning. Uh, I've got to say quickly, I'm not talking about myself, but I'm going to talk about myself because of that reason. I uh, just had an operation uh, just on uh, nine days ago and that was pretty evasive on my legs. So uh, getting here this morning, uh, it was a bit of a journey to uh, actually find a parking spot and then walk up around here, as probably all of you as well. But uh, two days ago, I wouldn't have been able to come down them steps. So today was quite, a, <laughs> quite an achievement. So uh, being here this morning with each and every one of you, it's, uh, it's really special and unique. Now you all know that Welcome to Country as its origins right here on the east coast of Australia, and it goes back many, many thousands of years. We've always had uh, Welcome to Country when we have uh, big celebrations and big corroborees, and we celebrate by song and dance. It's done today as I'm doing it orally. It's no less significant. It holds the same importance. So today is a gathering. This is a corroboree. So we're continuing on that tradition that's been, <coughs> pardon me, that's been going on for thousands of years because Welcome to Country doesn't see Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal or our ethnicity. It just sees us as Australians. So, uh, once again, uh, regardless of whether, whether we've been here for uh, 10,000 years, one year, or a new child born today, if you're born on country, then you're part of country and you belong to country. And it's lovely this morning as well, uh, knowing that um, I can get up and give welcome to country without being in that little specific time frame of uh, you've got to speak within a minute or two minutes or so. So this morning I've been given a couple of minutes, but I'm not going to be here for 20, so don't worry. <laughs> it's only a short moment. But uh, having said that, because of that, 
I can deliver welcome to country in a relaxed way. And I love saying to people, I don't have a set speech or a set talk when I give welcome to country. I do what I call having a yarn. Within that yarn, I deliver the protocols of welcome to country. And part of that is saying as well, uh, when I have, have opportunity to give welcome to country, it's not always just from that traditional perspective, but it's from an urban Australian, urban Aboriginal Australian perspective of being born in this beautiful place here. And, and I can't help it, I get really very, very cheeky about it. Uh, the most beautiful, uh, born, being born on the most beautiful traditional land, the most beautiful city in the most beautiful country in the world. And I get the opportunity to say that repeatedly with apologies to all people, that, uh, but you know, well, no matter. And when we, talk, when we talk about country as well, the country we come from within Australia, as Australians, we all know that uh, when we say country, it's the area that you come from. You belong to that area. We don't own country, country owns us. So no matter, no matter how long we've been here, uh, the country that you come from, you're, you are that connection. Now, I was born at La Perouse, where the uh, Europeans uh, first touched the east coast of Australia. My clan land runs from uh, Circular Key right through up to Redwood and right around this area here. So my people, the Gadigal people, have had the longest continuous unbroken association with Europeans since the settlement of Australia. But as I said a moment ago, it's not always just from that traditional perspective, but it's from an urban Australian perspective of being born on this country and uh, growing up around this area here. There's no part that I, I don't go to that I don't have a personal connection with, the same as each and every one of you. If you think back to the country where you come from, when we say that, once again, it's the area that you come from, we all have that uh, special connection and, that, and, and, and those memories. So my memory here, from this area here, is moving over to Annandale as a young 16-year-old and having all the relatives over this side at Redburn. Uh, so back in those days, you walked everywhere. So coming through here, coming through the university was a shortcut. So there's no part of this place that I don't know today. And it's part of, once again, it's part of my cultural history. So once again, to each and every one of you, um, it's, it's always with uh, great pleasure that um, I have opportunity to give welcome to country. And, and I'll just pass, share with you quickly, I had a great pleasure two days ago of uh, giving welcome to country out at uh, uh, East Ed the uh, 200, celebration of 200 years of the uh, lighthouse out there. And it was quite spectacular and quite moving uh, being on a place that, uh, that we have that significant uh, history that uh, belongs and is part of all of us, you know. So once again, no matter how many times I give welcome, whether it's 100 times or once a year, each and every opportunity I give, I have, I should say, to give welcome uh, is as important as the last time or the next time that I'll give welcome to country. So once again, to each and every one of you, uh, Thank you for listening and may the spirits of my ancestors walk beside each and every one of you and protect you whilst you're in Gadigal land, you're a country, as I know they walk beside and protect me. Um, just in keeping with Aboriginal custom and protocol, I'd like to pay respects to elders and descendants, both past and present, of my people, the people of the Eora, and thank them for the caring of the waterways and the land for the thousands of years of which we all benefit from today, and extend that welcome and gratitude to each and every one of you and pay respects to your elders and descendants, both past and present as well, for without those people, none of us would be here today. So when we do that, take that moment to pay respects to elders past and pre present, we then remember that they aren't just a date and a name from the past, but they're real people that had real lives and real love and uh, real sorrow the same as us today. And without those people, none of us would be here. So once again, to each and every one of you, welcome to my country, welcome to your country, welcome to our country. And just in closing real quickly, you know that we're all on our journey of life and uh, I'm a bit more ad advanced than uh, a lot of you people here today. But uh, one, part of my journey, as a young man, I worked a lot of occupations. And uh, one of those occupations, or a couple of those occupations, was driving heavy vehicles, uh, working on the waterfront and so forth. And the people, I didn't know it at the time on my life's journey, but the people that were coming in and out of my life over those years had quite an extraordinary effect on me that I didn't know at the time until you, you you go that journey and, and you get to where you are today. And one of those people out of many, many, many was an Italian gentleman I, I met way back in the uh, late 60s who came across just after the war and um, uh, Ezio Walgardi was his name. And uh, the stories that we'd, we'd sit and yarn to each other about during our smoke breaks and stuff like that was quite extraordinary. And he was one of those first of many that uh, had that extraordinary, uh, like, uh, um, impression on, on my life. I, I, that I didn't know at the time, just listening to those stories. I didn't know that were going to have a great meaning in, in my future. And they've gave, and all those journeys I'm talking about have given me a greater understanding of the privilege that I have to stand on traditional land and invite people to it. So once again, to each and every one of you, as in, as in closing, 
welcome to my country, welcome to your country, welcome to our country. And thank you all. I hope today is um, wonderfully productive. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle and I also felt that it was important that we acknowledge as your representatives um, the traditional custodians of the land. And we wanted to recognise that teaching and learning has been happening um, for thousands of years on this land and that under this um, concrete and asphalt, this land is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. But we also recognise that we have come here from across the country and some of you from across the world. We've got some international guests today as well. So we want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and research um, and spend our time every day as well. So we also wanted to now welcome, we've got a, a double duo today to, to open the conference. So we have Annette Woods, who is our president, um, and we've also got Deb Hayes, who is our incoming president. So I'm going to um, welcome Annette up to, to open the conference now. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. What an honour to be here and what an amazing honour to actually be able to welcome you all here. We have more than, I think it's just on 80 people, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, just before I started, I also wanted to acknowledge that we are standing on other people's lands and that's really important, I, I think, to actually just stop for a moment and think, you know, on these same spaces have been spaces where people have come together to talk about kids and health and young people and pathways and education, really important conversations. And for me, whenever I'm going to be engaged in these kinds of talks and um, and yarns, as Uncle um, called them, really important to stop and think, you know, we're just, it kind of puts into perspective, I think, um, what we're doing today, right? We're still having really important conversations, but we're having them on lands where people have been talking about similar issues and similar problems for many, many, many thousands of years. So, in, you know, an important thing to start the day with, I think. Since we're talking about history, my very first connections, well, not my very first, I did attend several um, pre-conference workshops uh, as a PhD student and, and early AARE member um, back in the early, early 2000s. Um, but my first uh, connection to actually kind of organising these sorts of things was when I was on the local um, conference committee for Brisbane back in 2008. And at that time, we'd had a bit of a break and not had conference, pre-conference workshops for postgrads and early career researchers. It was a bit of a humbug around that, you know, really they weren't that useful, people weren't that, you know, they wouldn't bother to turn up and, you know, how could they bother to come a day before the conference? And if they did come then, they might not come for the whole conference, these sorts of things. Um, and myself and Robin Henderson decided, no, We'd been to these when, when you know, we were first starting our postgrad uh, work and they were really important to us and we knew that they were about relationships and yes, the sessions were wonderful but you actually got to meet people which meant you could kind of front into the conference knowing someone that you, you, know, you didn't have to stand by yourself. All of those really important networking things uh, we knew happened as well as going to great sessions. Uh, so we kind of, you know, fought a little bit and we were told, yes, you could have them, but they must not cost anything. So we called on our friends to come and present and that's kind of still the tradition because everybody that presents for you today is volunteering their time, um, which is wonderful, right? We have amazing members in AARE who just keep giving. Um, so remember that as you start to join us as an association. Um, I went to the bakery and bought muffins and instant coffee and tea bags and that was our um, breakfast. So when I have a look at just how far they've come um, in that kind of decade, decade and a half, and how wonderful over many years, brilliant people like Amanda and Michelle and the many uh, people who've gone before them who, you know, work really hard to bring together a really strong program for you um, to make sure that there's plenty of room for networking, those sorts of things. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed each year when I am, am welcomed down to, um, to welcome you that just how amazing and how much these have grown. And we certainly didn't have 80 people, but we did, we did have a lot of people and we did manage to keep that budget uh, balanced, which was great. So, um, and they've continued since then. So for those of you, and I know we've got a real wide variety here, we have some already long-term AARE members, we have some uh, members that you know are just joining and just coming in, it might be your first conference. And we also have people who are here for the day, which is wonderful, um, try us out and we'd love to have you as members, clearly. Um, we're doing lots of things for postgrad and, and early career researchers. We had conference bursaries this year for the very first time um, in recognition of and trying to say, look, we understand that the context um, of academia now is 
a little less friendly, perhaps, um, than we might hope in terms of people <coughs> moving into full-time jobs and getting tenured positions and those sorts of things. So we know it's not easy. We know it's not easy as a postgrad student as well. Um, we honour and recognise your commitment and we're very welcoming and very, very happy to have you here and we hope that it's a very useful day. Consider also our special interest groups. If you're looking kind of for a smaller group within a big group, um, those, uh, those groups of people will allow you to kind of consolidate in your particular area, which is wonderful as well. And throughout the conference program, I think there's something like 35 um, special events that SIG uh, coordinators have organised um, across there. So have a look at the program for those sorts of things beyond just the papers as well. Brilliant keynotes throughout the, um, throughout the week. Uh, and just one other little thing I did want to tell you about. We've had a really interesting working group running all of this year after a motion at our last uh, AGM. Our last AGM, we had over 100 people attend. And it's not always been that big, so it was quite remarkable to see that many people in the room really wanting to get involved in the association, which was wonderful. And we had two motions put forward by people from the floor. One of those was about the fact that AARE should make a statement about uh, refugees and asylum seekers on Manus Island. Um, and uh, we've extended that, of course, into the um, detention program. And, and you may well have seen, if you're involved in the um, association, we've, we've done that throughout, and, um, throughout the year and, and made sure that it's come at particular opportune times. So that was the first motion. The second motion was that AARE actually make some kind of stand or get involved a little bit in the notion of what's happening with the casualisation of the academic workforce and how that might actually be implicated for building rich teaching and research lives as an as a, um, education academic. So we've had a working group working on that. There is a session, a special session that will run um, in the uh, conference program and I'm actually really proud of that because a few years ago, the, the last couple of years we have had not the same sort of session, but a session where people have come together to talk about those sessions. But it's happened outside of the program, so at night. And this year, um, we're in a position to actually have that kind of work happening within the program. And that's, that actually is something that's very important, I think, for the association. So have a great day. I don't want to waste any more of your time. I know you're editing at the bit to get out there and actually have some conversations. Um, I want to, I don't know that we've actually got them in the room, but thank the presenters. As I said, we have amazing volunteers within our association that just keep coming back and doing that kind of work. And that's the only way that we are actually able to be the association we are, um, is based on the volunteer work of many, many hundreds of people. Um, but, you know, I want to thank those that are actually volunteering especially for us today. And special thanks, of course, to Amanda and Michelle in her absence for the amazing work that they've done this, this year. So, thanks very much and have a great day. So some of the other executive members are actually in the room at the moment. Um, I just saw Aspa up the back. Aspa is our communications representative, expert, coordinator, everything. Um, as I said, we've got Deb Hayes, who is your, your incoming president from next year, and that gets to have a little bit of her life back, <laughs> perhaps. Um, is there anyone else that I can't actually see? Uh, we've got Lisa Hunter up the back. And Deb Cunningham. Oh, you're just behind the camera. <laughs> And Nicole Mocker. Uh, uh, so Nicole is someone that you want to bail up at <laughs> the conference. Now, there is actually um, a special um, opportunity to spend some time with Nicole and the rest of the editorial team of the Australian Educational Researcher Journal, which is, of course, our AARE journal. Um, and we don't believe in metrics, but it is now a Q1 journal. So for those of you who are constantly being told to publish Q1, publish with Nicole. So, um, Nicole, would you like to just let us know when that, that session is? Uh, that is Tuesday lunchtime, I believe 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, the idea is that you might grab a lunch and follow along. It's going to be very informal, just an opportunity to meet, talk about the journal, about what you're doing, 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 what you Thank you.
doing your conference for the first time, uh, Monday lunchtime, and first time as lunch as well. Please just, uh, you won't need to grab your lunch because finally, after about four or five years of me saying, why can't we have lunch with the first time as lunch <laughs> instead of, we actually have lunch inside the room. So you'll be able to come to the room and collect your lunch and have a lunch together, which would be great. So we're on our way upstairs again to finish the second of our um, executive meeting days. So um, so we'll be working too. I'm sure your days quite just lightly, um, so more. <laughs> we'll be having a great be time up there on <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, um, Dr Naomi Barnes. Naomi is a lecturer in literacy and she's an early career researcher at the Queensland University of Technology. Naomi's work folds literacy and sociological methods together through research into online composition and how social media affects communication, particularly between education researchers and the teaching profession. Her current project is on how key literacy research has made its way into the classroom and to what extent social media has supported professional engagement with that research. Naomi has published on blogging as research communication and methods, which use status updates and online comments as data. Naomi tweets at Dr. Noman. She's Twitter famous, so <laughs> she's had a lot of people come up today saying, oh, I know you, which is always really exciting. So on a personal note, um, I've actually worked with Naomi for a number of years, um, and she exemplifies the things that we're hoping to, to get talking about today. So she um, works collegially, collegially, she's collaborative, um, and she is tenacious at finding ways to work around what can be really um, challenging systems at times. And Naomi is also the brightest witch of her age. <laughs> um, and I'd like to ask you all to welcome Naomi um, to come and speak with you today. It's nice to see you all here today. Some familiar faces are making me feel a little less no nervous. Thank you for smiling at me. Okay, so that's me. I, last night I got teased for putting a title slide in because you're not supposed to anymore. Those sort of things, but there's my title slide. So if you want to tweet or you want to email me afterwards. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Well, this is what it was called six months ago when I put in my abstract. Okay. <laughs> just so you don't get a little bit disappointed. All right. Before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. As we share knowledge and teaching and learning today, I would also like to thank those who have made it before me. Sorry, I'm going to cry. <laughs> My mum went here to the teacher's college just across the way. She came here and was involved in the feminist and anti-war protests of the 1960s and 70s. Sydney University is very strong in that activist history. I'd also like to acknowledge Chancellor William Manning, who agreed to admit women to university. This university did it 30 years before Oxford and was one of the first in the world. Charles Perkins, the first Aboriginal man to graduate from Australian University and the activist culture of the 1960s and 70s withdrew together civil rights, women's liberation and early gay liberation movements. Without them, I could not stand here today before you. So how did I get here, basically? Have you ever been for a walk in the city? Who here is from, um, who here is a tourist? Okay, do you tend to go down to the harbour? Do you intend to go and check out the Opera House, the city, all those places? Well, it's very nicely paved, wide boulevards to put lots of people through them. Who here is a local? Where's the best coffee? Because I, have, I haven't had a good coffee yet today. <laughs> you might not want to share it with me because it might be your little secret and you don't want hordes of people descending on your favourite coffee place and turning it into um, the harbour, basically. 
So what I want to talk about today is how I got here, okay? I'm going to say it was by sheer bloody mindedness, basically, quite a bit of privilege. And um, I just want to quickly talk about that. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my partner who worked a shitty job for six years while I was doing my PhD and could work part-time, drop my teaching wage. But today, I want to acknowledge that privilege, but I also want to talk about a little bit about the bloody-mindedness and how I got here. I wasn't very wealthy when I grew, the way I grew up. And I was always told that education would get me out of the poverty. And I know it's way more complex than that, but for me it's worked. It's about saying, I never want to be like that again, and education's going to do it for me. So I continued to work hard. I got kicked over so many times, and I've stood up again, and I continue to work with this sheer bloody mindedness, basically. So basically, um, I'm standing here before you still just finishing up being a sessional academic since 2010. I have my first contract for more than three months and I'm at QUT who, um, I don't know, I'm just going to be arrogant about it, who are pinching themselves about what they got. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how I got here, basically. So, as I said, so some of you are going to go down to the harbour, right? You're going to have a look at these boulevard. You're going to have a look at these beautiful places at what is Sydney. Some of you knew where to go to get coffee before you got here. And you went there. You might have your secret places, your locals, the place where the person who serves you coffee sees you walk in the door and starts making it for you. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is about being a local in your own research journey and to avoid being made to feel like tourists can tell you what to do. Because basically, that is my journey. It's been about ignoring the tourists and believing and loving my local. All right. As we continue to go to our locals, the city changes around us. Our footprints make a difference. So basically, if you have a place that you love to go and everybody else discovers it, you, they continue to want to go there as well and our city changes around us. Once grand old buildings become dilapidated and then they become boutiques with markets, Airbnbs and basically places that used to be places of ill repute are now tourist attractions. So this is what a research journey can be like. You are the one who is looking at the places where nobody goes, the places which are local to you that you have fallen in love with and you want to understand. You are not there as a tourist. As we walk around, we shape the city and the city shapes us. As you practice your everyday research life, you know the nooks and the crannies, you know it so well, you can look at it from all different angles. You can write poetry about it. Poetry is about changing, changing the words, order, and seeing if it still makes sense. You know that language so well that you can look at it from multiple different angles. You are the local in your research life. You shape it and it shapes you. So I want to caution you to look out for the tourists. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of those um, encounters that I've had in my research life where tourists have tried to tell me what to do, basically. All right, so I walked quite alone in my research life. I had no idea I was going to be walking alone, but I was. 
In 2010, I decided I wanted to do a PhD in whether history students really were being advantaged by taking history at university. So I wanted to know if me standing in front of my Year 12 history students meant that, and I would say to them, you do this, you'll do well at university, because that's what most history teachers were saying. I would say things like, oh, I was speaking to a lecturer in the business school and they said the modern history students are the best students that they get. The law, oh, a law academic was telling me that they like the ones that did history as well as legal studies. Okay, and I wanted to know if that actually was true. I wanted to have a look at the information and knowledge flow between high school and the university really was happening. Like, did it actually work that way? Was history actually advantaging um, academic achievement when they went to university? Anyway, by the time I started thinking about it and I got introduced to this thing called variables, I realised <laughs> that there was no way I could ever make a statement that history actually was the thing which caused people to be in um, to be good at uh, their university studies. So I started looking around at to what else I could do. I'd been accepted into my PhD. Let's have another think about what's going on. I wanted to talk with young people. There was this thing going on, which everybody thinks is a nightmare now, but it was really trendy back in 2009, called the first year experience and student success. And... Um, and it, which resulted in those of you that are sessional teachers, your surveys. So apologies for being a part of that. Um, and uh, basically, <laughs> basically, I was uh, told, you need to work in the first year experience. You need to understand how students are feeling success in the first year experience. And I was like, OK. All right, so I changed my mind and I went off on this other really dynamic new area of learning, of um, higher education research. Started reading around and one of the things which I noticed when I was reading around in the literature on student, well, what's now called student success literature, but back then first year experience literature, was that the kids, I shouldn't call them kids, should I? Sorry. The students' voices were nowhere in that literature. So it was all this is my it was all academic saying this is my experience with the first year experience and this is what the students have said to me in my tutorials so very small focused I'm a great teacher and these students have come to me and told me what they think type research and I said, well, actually, what they really think isn't there because we know about the power dynamics between a teacher and a student. They're going to sit there, no matter how much they love you, they're going to sit there and tell you what you, they, you, they think they want you to hear. So, I'm going, so I decided that I was going to get the student voices and I was going to get the student voices in a way that nobody else had ever got the student voices because there was this little thing that was released in 2005 and went viral 2007. A little object was released in 2007 and by 2010 was on everybody's desks, the iPhone and Facebook. Now I was gonna go, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting them. I'm gonna watch what they do on Facebook. And they're gonna tell me what they really think because I'd been watching Facebook for a few years after my sister signed me up telling me MySpace was done. And <laughs> basically I was gonna go, I'm gonna find out what they really are saying because they'll tell the truth on Facebook. Now we know that that's a fairly naive, <laughs> naive understanding back in 2010, but nonetheless, this is my research journey and I've got the lectern. Okay. So, basically, um, I went to the methodology expert at Griffith University where I did my PhD, and the methodology expert went, no, 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 you are not doing that. And I went, okay, you're the boss. <laughs> and then I went to my confirmation, and I did this, I don't know, confirmation-y thing, which I tried to take the social media out and tried to work out how I'd do what I really wanted to do. And I did this really dense theory which explained how what I was doing was awesome and um, using um, what 
focus groups and pizza. And um, basically, basically the confirmation committee went, you need to use social media. <laughs> and I went, but that guy said I wasn't allowed to because I was too young in my research career. I didn't understand what I was getting myself into. Um, well, nobody knew anything about what social media was doing to our lives, really. There are a few um, souls that could pick it, but um, they were very few and far between, especially in this big cacophony of oh, Facebook is awesome. Okay, so basically I went, okay, I'm going to watch what they're doing on Facebook. I went to the, Griff the ethics people and I wrote this massive ethics thing about if the students were suicidal, this is what I knew what to do, I was a teacher. If they were talking about these things, I would know what to do, protect the students, protect the students. These sorts of things that I'm watching, no, I'm not stalking them, Cambridge Analytica style, but yes, I am because I'm inserting university into their everyday life on social media. And the ethics committee went, oh yeah, that's a, we don't care about that. They're putting it out there. We want to make sure that they're not saying something about the university that we don't like. So I had to rewrite my ethics application <laughs> to say this is what I'm going to do with the, with the data to, when they say things like, oh, that so-and-so is um, not, uh, not pregnant, she's just full of bullshit. And I had to basically <laughs> watch that for a year of them abusing academic staff online. And I had to um, protect the university by making sure that that information was not put into my thesis. So the juiciest information was not allowed in there because you can pretty much work out who so-and-so is by the fact that maybe they were pregnant and the, and the lecturer of this first year course in 2010. So it was... It was very, it was, a, it was like I've got all this data which is telling me something and then I had to write a thesis with half of it because of what they'd said. So basically I was allowed to go ahead, I was allowed to become, I was allowed to work with Facebook. Nobody knew what this would turn into back then and um, nobody else besides me had actually watched them live. Everybody else that had done Facebook before I did it um, created a group and watched that group. I just became friends with them and watched Facebook for a year, wanting to poke my eyes out, basically watching 17-year-olds Facebook for a year when Facebook was a bit more like Twitter, where people would just poke... You know, Instagram wasn't really around and it was all basically just putting their stuff out there all the time the way... It, and... Um, I, yeah, so it was, it was a very exciting year and then I had to work out what to do with that stuff and I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. All right, so I basically walked alone in this so my supervisors had absolutely no idea what I was doing. They just knew that the ethics committee thought it was important so I could write an ethics paper to tell the university what social media research was all about. So, um, and I have written that paper with them <laughs> with my supervisors about us navigating this early years of social media ethics and those sorts of things. I mean, it's changed dramatically now. It's much harder to do what I did. I got that little gap in time where people, before the door shut on being able to stalk people online for academic reasons. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So... Um, so what I want to talk about basically is how I worked within a system that kind of wanted me to be there but didn't really want to know me. So people coming out of that PhD, I became the person who knew how to teach people to do Twitter rather than the person who thought really deeply about the nature of what was being posted online. And that's an ongoing... For those of you that are... Anyone else here studying social media? That is an ongoing problem with those of us that study social media. The academy latches onto us and goes, oh, we want to understand this thing, so can you please teach us how to do it? But there is a big realm of scholarship out there that's thinking very, very deeply about this thing which is mediating our world through communication and those sorts of things, and that's what I do. 
but I will teach you how to use Twitter if you buy me some gin. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, basically, what I want to talk to you about are the loopholes. So, I am going to say that I walked through my academic life because there were so many problems. I didn't run, I didn't get in a car and go full steam ahead. I was not given a scholarship. I was a part-timer that just really wanted to be there. And I watched so many people jump, hail Ubers and scream past me as I was just walking along one step in front of the other. And I was sitting there going, I was the first. Well, actually, Neil Selwyn was the first, but I was the first to actually watch people in their private accounts. Neil did public accounts. I did <laughs> the private accounts and um, I was sitting there going, I was the first, but now I have all these people ahead of me talking about social media that have never done this because the door came down. And I felt very resentful. I was like, you've got to listen to me. Like, I've been there. I did it. I was that person that was there in that time doing that thing that everybody thought was exciting but now is wrong. You know, those sorts of things. And basically, I, um, I, so I had to find loopholes. I had to find my way forward to say, so what? Because that's what you've got to think about in your research. You've got to say, so what? So what? You watched teenagers for a year on Facebook. So what? So I actually had to think about that and I ended up not having a thesis about the first year experience. I ended up, even though my thesis was written about the first year experience, I had a thesis which um, was about the ethics of using social media. And I didn't know that until I submitted it. And I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> I'll, take to you, I'll talk to you about that, um, that's another situation. So when we walk through our research lives, like I've done, you begin to notice the locals. You notice the shadows and the ambiguities. Um, Legacy Russell calls it glitch feminism. And basically what that is, is in a society that conditions the public to feel discomfort or outright fear in the errors and malfunctions of our social and cultural mechanics. Walking through our research life, you notice the glitches, the shadows, and the ambiguities. And that means that when you feel like you've done something wrong and somebody is standing there and saying to you, you said, oh, I've written my discussion chapter. Oh, it's awesome. I'm really happy with it. And someone comes to you, some tourist comes to you and says, oh, I thought you had to write two. You go, you have to sit there and you have to think, right, there's a glitch going on here. Every time somebody says to you, this doesn't, oh, that doesn't sound right. That's not how it is when you speed through your, your, your PhD life. It's about finding the glitches and knowing that the fact that there is a system already trying to hide the sexual, racial, social, economic and cultural violence that is in it then probably glitches are needed, all right? You are looking for place where there needs to be corrections. They, the system, glosses over it as to what you need to do for your thesis to get through to the end of this, to get through to the end of your research, and the mistakes are the places you need to stop and think. Well, what they tell you are mistakes are the places you need to stop and think. So basically, um, we leave traces of our lives behind us in our everyday lives. So even before there were computers tracking everything that we did, as they say, um, we left impressions of where we went. So where we walked on our footpaths, we, um, we wore them away. When we walked through tunnels, people graffiti on them as... We can see here. Basically, we leave those impressions, we wear them down, and we choose to sit on steps rather than the seats. We choose to take a shortcut rather than go around the path. Our academic system thinks it's organised us, but we continue to push through on our desire paths. 
which is what one of these are. And planners hate it. They put up fences to stop people doing it because of they want people to walk around the pathway. They want people to go along the route that has been pre-planned and predetermined rather than taking the, um, taking the route that they've designed for us. Despite the well-intentioned planning, sometimes people just walk, vote with their feet. And that is something when you're feeling very overwhelmed by the system, by the patriarchy, by your thesis, by what people are telling you about how this works and how it doesn't work. And when people tell you that you making that decision is not going to be good for your career, you basically continue, you have to think about what you're doing and whether you voting with your feet and taking a desire path is ethical, it is virtuous for you, not for the tourist that walks into your research life. So basically, your research life is going to be made up of eruptions. So eruptions are a term which are used by uh, which is used by uh, Michel Foucault and by Donna Haraway to talk about uh, two different. They're, they're they're similar, but they're also a little bit different. So basically, eruptions are Foucault might say. How did this flower get here in this concrete jungle? He might have a look at the cracks in the concrete. He might look at how the way we've walked down that street has changed the direction that the water flows. He might talk about the prevailing wind which blew the seed into that crack. Haraway might ask us to have a look at the biology, have a look at the biology, the genetic makeup of the seed, have a look at the nutrients in the soil beneath it. Both are important, and we both need to pay, and we all need we need to pay attention to both. And when we do, extraordinary things happen. So these eruptions are things which happen that weren't supposed to happen on the path that's been set out for you. So everybody's story in research, everybody's story is a spatial story. And if you take one idea away from this today besides the fact your keynote cried, um, was that every... is to think in a spatial rather than linear matter, manner. If you took my story as a linear and discursive, so um, if you read it down the page in a line, you might be asking yourself, how come she carried on? I've asked myself that as well. But I have a spatial mindset. I also have a history of poverty. And basically, when my, when my, and basically when my, res, when my, research, my research is not forging a path through my life, it is part of my life and my life is part of my research. I think um, the first time I realised this, I was reading uh, uh, Laurel Richardson and she was talking about uh, sociology and about the fact that no, nothing, nothing is done without an agenda. So back in the 1980s, early 1980s, late 1970s, Laurel Richardson, one of the first women to be appointed as a professor, tenured professor in America, was talking about how even a cancer researcher is there for an agenda. They might have had somebody who is, so somebody who has died in their life and that's the reason they're there. So no matter how much people insist that there is a scientific approach to this, that there is that you have to remove all the fluff and just get to the randomised control, it doesn't work that way. So even the people who talk about that are there because they have a love of students. They have a love of education. They believe that this is the right path for getting the right results. And that is the agenda that people are there for. It's not about, it's not about thinking of it as right or wrong. It's about thinking of it as what is the reason somebody is here and why are they doing it. So basically, I have a spatial mindset. And basically that means that when I get an eruption, 
in my life. I do not see it as a barrier for me going forward. I stand there and I look around and I say, what else is there? What other way could I think? I talked about all those Uber drivers going ahead of me in social media research. I sit there and I go, I read them and I go, what are they saying that me walking have noticed that they have not? So here's one of my eruptions. These are my daughters. They were both born during my candidature. I did my confirmation, eight months pregnant with the tallest one. Okay, so basically somebody, people kept saying to me, you're going to have to, you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to. I thought that I was the only woman in the world who had ever had a baby during her PhD. <laughs> um, I had two. Has anyone else had m multiple? Look, look at it, look at this. It was not until I got on Twitter that I realised there were others. <laughs> okay, because everyone tended to hide it. I remember in my um, uh, masters, I studied a, a historian called Londa Scheibinger, and she did some research into academic women who would pretend they'd gotten fat, take their four weeks leave have a caesarean and go back to work and not tell anyone they'd had a baby in the 1980s because it was basically, it's the end of your career. Now, having read that in my... Uh, worked with Londa Scheibinger in my master's research, when I walked into Griffith University, I said, they're coming with me. I am going to stand there and I am going to say women have children when they're PhD age. It's okay. All right? So my eldest did poo on the dean's floor, but we won't go there. <laughs> that was an eruption which I picked up the child and ran out hoping the smell didn't linger. <laughs> okay, basically, um, so also... It makes it much... So what happened is having children slowed me down. The eruption slowed me down. It also meant that I became a social media researcher because when my eldest was born, as I said, my confirmation, I was eight months pregnant. The... Um, oh, I've got to keep an eye on time. I'm just getting too excited. How much time have I got? Oh, I've got heaps of time. <laughs> Um, basically, she, uh, I set up these um, focus groups with first year students. I booked a room, I ordered pizza, and they didn't show up. So all I had was Facebook. And I could either, so my, we sat there and went, okay, so it's a Facebook thesis. And we're going to look at how to do a thesis just with Facebook as opposed to the other approaches. So I had to, I got there and it twisted things. Now, what I could have done is, because the biggest problem with it was I was sitting there going, I'm never doing that again. If they're never showing up, I'm not even trying again. Because my daughter was so young, she was too young to go to kindy, go to childcare. I had to find a babysitter. I could not find a baby. I still can't find a babysitter. You know, I could not find a babysitter to go and do my research. So I just went there and go, okay, well, I'm just doing Facebook because I can breastfeed and read through the, read through the, um, the status updates while I'm doing that. So she became a part of my research life. She also interrupted my research life, but this became my first <laughs> publication... It featured on the front page of the higher education section of the Guardian newspaper because they asked for a call out as to what it was like doing a thesis with children. <laughs> and I said that it was very quiet one day, so I took the opportunity to do some writing, wrote a couple of pa paragraphs, tried to work out, thought I'd better go and check out why it was so quiet, and hence I entered the publication being published, <laughs> basically, because this is what was going on. It's quite
good. She's quite a good artist. <laughs> For a three-year-old, I thought. <laughs> so... Um, Basically, we kept that couch for as long as we could because it's quite precious. In the end, I just let her cover the whole thing and keep going. So these were eruptions in my life which actually, if I'd sat there, I could have got so frustrated and said, that's it, I can't do this anymore. They are more important to me than my research or I can make my research include them. I wrote to Laurel Richardson when I discovered her, and she wrote back to me with an email full of spelling mistakes, and I thought, oh, well, it's no... <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> that changed the hero worship I had of her to know that she was a normal human being. And I said, I'm so impressed that you said things like, my children and my gardening and my love of literature and my love of pop culture can actually become a part of my research life. Thank you so much for changing my mind. And she wrote back and said, I'm so happy, I'm so pleased that I've made such an impact on your life. Anyway, I was pretty excited. I was going to look, I was trying to find her email to show you, to just show Laura Richardson wrote to me, because that's pretty cool. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So, yes, it's been difficult. I've been forging desire paths all the way through my, all the way through my thesis, all the way through my research career, because basically when you do a social media thesis at a time where people don't understand social media but want to include it in their academic practice, you become sort of like this shiny object that people like and want to have around but don't take seriously because you're just the Twitter girl, okay? So I had to work very hard to change that perception of myself. And I must say that as I did this, it's also very fun and very rewarding because what you do is you forge strong, amazing friendships and support networks along the way. That's because you took the time to get there. You didn't scream past in an Uber. You stopped and you walked and you met people and you shook hands and you sat down and had coffee with people along the way. You think more deeply because these people take the time to know who you are. And some of these people are doing little smiles because they're here and I thank them very much. They wanted to know how I thought. They didn't just see me as the Twitter chick. They just, they saw me as doing some really deep, interesting thinking, and I wanted to know what they were thinking about, and together we forged something stronger than just research which goes through really fast. So when you talk, when you're thinking about going into the academy, I want you to think about doing the academy more deeply <coughs> and act in a way to bring about the academy that you want to be in rather than the one that you see around you. Surround yourself like I have with people who believe in me despite the failures. So one of the reasons that I was able to develop these relationships and not one of the people who I'm talking about lives in Brisbane, the Brisbane people I'm, I was a shiny object for a very long time, was through <coughs> blogging. And yes, I'm going to talk about blogging because that's the way that I forge many friendships, many strong rela research relationships is through my blogging. Your social media person at university may be saying to you, you need to blog to get your work out there. Asper before said, blog about your Q1s to get your work out there to the end users. That is the main message about blogging that is out there in our profession. I'm going to say to you that I blogged because I wanted to talk about this. My supervisors, because I'd done something so very weird, 
my supervisors wanted me to do a very traditional thesis. They're like, oh, you can't go off and do a narrative thesis with Facebook research. It would just be too out there for an examiner. So I want you to do a straight down the line, linear thesis, bang, bang, bang. I don't want any emotion in it. It's all sociological. It's no, no emotion in there. That's the thesis that you're going to do. And then I got to the methodology chapter and it said... How did you do your methodology? And I said, I did my methodology breastfeeding my child, working it out as I went along. And they said, you can't say that. So I ended up blogging it because I had to get it out of my system. I was like, my thesis is not what happened. My blog is what happened. And it was amazing. That's when I found out that there are other women that did... PhDs with their children, having giving birth to children as well, and created a really strong network of women who we hashtag PhD mummed for about four years. And I'm still very good friends with those people. I also blog to experiment with writing approaches as well, and to experiment in a way that was a bit safe, because I know it seems like online isn't safe, but I think when you've got an audience of people that feel just like you, it's always going to be safe. There's always going to be support there. So I began blogging about my... I slowly began blogging about my ideas. And more people came on board. People from all over the world came on board once I started blogging about my ideas. I forged relationships in the UK and the US that I never would have forged if all I had done is do Q1 papers and a thesis because they saw me. So there's a sociologist in America that um, Tracy McMillan Cotton, if anybody knows who I wrote about my thesis in a blog and she tweet, retweeted it and said, this is so cool, you know. So it was just like 800 words. This is so cool and now we are... We talk about stuff all the time and she's, like, really f Twitter famous and, um, and like, a key person in, soci in, in uh, digital sociology over in the US. Um, there are people who have come to me from prestigious universities in the UK who have asked if they can work together, one of them from the Oxford Institute of... Um, the Oxford Internet Institute and we've written just a little... Uh, uh, London School of Economics blog together, but it was still forging. And then when I went overseas, we caught up for the first time, met in person after we'd written together, and he dragged me all over Oxford showing me where Narnia stuff was and J.A.R. Tolkien, and we didn't talk work at all. It was like, you got to see his we were so J.A.R. Tolkien um, exhibition. He showed me the Narnia door. And it was like, it was just... Wonderful. It's wonderful to forge these relationships where he knew what I would want to see and didn't just want to sit me down at the pub that, John, uh, that um, Bob Hawke drank his yard glass at <laughs> and um, Bill Clinton didn't inhale. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, uh, we sat down and we talked about the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things, because we knew each other through our work. Okay, so blogging isn't just about getting your research out there. Blogging is about talking to people. It's about forging relationships. And that's how my relationships are forged. I'm not standing here today and doing the academic you must blog, but I think it's really important. Like, I have forged relationships with people I don't see every day, but I have not... I've, it's it's still quite difficult on the on the ground because people uh, still don't quite get it on the ground. I have to explain it, and then I sit there and just go, "Okay, fair enough. You just don't get it. I'm not even going to try." Okay, so it's still quite difficult on the ground. Did I already do that one? Yeah. Okay. So people will tell you that you're ruining your career for taking these risks because you are thinking spatially. So you're going around in different directions all the time. It doesn't look like you're on a clear path. They'll tell you that you're, what you're doing is not worthy. 
They'll think that you did a PhD in how to use Twitter and not take the time to know you because they are only looking at the objects in your research life, which is basically just the title, possibly the abstract, which may, is a good reason to say that that's why they're important, by the way. Okay. Um, and they define you by them. They see Facebook in, your, in the titles of what you talk about and they see you blog about pop culture and they see you um, and they see you um, lauded by those that do support you, but they do not show up to hear you talk. Okay? They're not interested in you. So don't give them the time of day. Do not give them your emotional energy. They might, I don't care if they're a professor. If they do not know who you are and are acting like a tourist in your research life, dismiss them like you would dismiss a tourist at your local coffee shop. So are you forging a new path? Do you believe in it? Are you open to thinking spatially? If they haven't taken the time to know you, don't listen. I will caution you to be careful, though, if you're looking at your local, trying to turn it into something that's a little bit dilapidated, something that you love and you want everybody to know about. I want you to think about the paths you travel if you decide to take this process. It is even more important to slow down when you are forging a new path. Think about the possible consequences of telling everybody that this is a great place to hang out. Appreciate those who have gone before you. Appreciate the professors that you disagree with but made it possible for you to be there. Approach them with a sense of grace. I do not agree with you. I do not agree with your processes. However, thank you so much for doing things that allowed me to come behind you. You were just as important in getting me here, even though... I no longer agree with you. It is a spatial relationship where everybody is there for a reason. It doesn't matter if they're quant. It doesn't matter if they're qual. It doesn't matter if they want to do randomised control. It doesn't matter if they want to do autoethnography. They're all there for the same reason when you take it in at a spatial level. So be careful about the way you speak to each other. Be careful about the ground you bulldoze over to forge your new path or are you just going to create desire paths? Because sometimes the new way is worse than the old way. So you need to be careful. You need to know your academic history. You need to know why things came from where they came from. So I really like to know about all these big name philosophers that we talk about. I want to know why they decided to think that way. I want to know why somebody thought that this was a really good approach. Okay? I want to know all that why. I don't just read a paper and say... OK, that's a really good idea. I'm going to use it. Sometimes I do. Um, but if there's something which resonates with me, I spend a long time. I read that paper one sentence at a time and often live tweet it, for those of you that follow me, and think very deeply about what that person is saying. So I want you to appreciate those who have gone before. Do some renovations. But remember that building something new in research has consequences. And as you and I get quite I kind of this is the kind of the first time I've really t spoken quite openly about the fact that I did Facebook research in a way which is actually considered today quite unethical. So it's I used to be embarrassed by that like once all the stuff started coming out about what these big tech companies really were about 
I got embarrassed and I didn't want people to know that I'd been there and I'd done that. So as you can see, doing something incredibly exciting isn't necessarily always ethical, okay? So just remember, as I said, that building something new often has consequences. So I stand here before you recently sessional and, early, and an early career researcher who walked to this spot standing here in front of you. If I told you that it took a year, a year to examine my thesis because I'd bastardised the methodology and my supervisors believed that in order to create a new space with rigour, it needed to have a methodology expert examine it, not a good idea. You don't mess with some... You don't send a thesis in to a methodology expert after you've bastardised that methodology. <laughs> Have that conversation with your supervisors, those of you who are doing PhDs and playing with their methods a little bit. But I had to. You can't do a Facebook method and make up a method out of the blue. You had to go somewhere to start and you had to do something with it. You had to say, where do I start with this? Anyway, so I've been kicked down a number of times. I have a, a thesis which you can read it. It's nothing special. I have a group of people who asked me if they could... Call, if, like sent me their phone numbers and asked if there's anything that they can do every time I got rejected from the 50 jobs that I've applied for. Rejected from the university that brought me up after being promised during my PhD that there was always going to be a place for me here and then academia changed and they could no longer look me in the eye because it was no longer true after being promised for so long. So having done that research across the time where um, academia has changed dramatically as well, I've had lots of crying, I've had lots of hatred, I've had lots, but I wanted this so badly. And now I've nearly got it. Three years is pretty good in ECR land, guys. Three years is pretty good. It's nothing to be sneezed at. And I'm standing here giving a keynote at the Australian Education Research Conference. OK? And I, so I've made it. I'm happy. I now have a double income so I can buy things. <laughs> um, and um, my children are happy because I'm happy. They were a lot a part of that process, them being unhappy because I was unhappy. And they are transforming as individuals now that I'm happy. Um, and I'm here because I took my time. I believe in my research. I believe in opening up this space that we know as social media. And I have forged academic relationships on the way and I am richer for it. Thank you very much. Oh, there's a clock up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for questions yeah. if anybody's got questions. Or you can go. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? We do have, we have about 10 minutes. Comments? There were, t like, I cried within 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so, I think I'll, from judging by the Twitter feed, a lot of people really connected with what cool. you were saying. So I'm pleased. I will do say that, questions? oh, okay, I will say that my workshop after this is a safer space and we're going to have these conversations. I've talked, so there's room to have these conversations in my workshop afterwards if you don't want to have them right now. But there was a question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 
else has to <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm scared of the experts. I am. They have to have beaten me down, basically, for me to decide that I don't like them anymore and want to take them out through revenge. But... <laughs> um, but seriously... <laughs> um, I think that um, just what I said at the end about... They've been there before you. They are the experts. But your job is to find the holes and the glitches in what they've said. So you approach them. I don't know. I'm not from your culture, so I don't know how it works. Um, I think even... I, I think in my culture, the fact that I'm doing social media research and not many education researchers know what that is, I'm often treated as the expert and then I have to take the critique once I explain it. You know, it's sort of that sort of relationship. So I can't really comment on that. But what I will say is they are the expert. They've been there a long time. But if you think about it spatially, how did they get there? Do a little bit of research into them and their reasons for being there. So don't just talk to them because of what their role is right now. Talk to them about, like, do sort of like a what we're calling a network analysis or a biography, a networked biography of how they got to be in that position in the first place. And then you might have some common ground for having a discussion with them. So get to know them. Remember that's what I said, get to know each other. Don't just see each other as competitive objects. Does that make sense? Absolutely. In that space as well. Yeah, and it takes a lot of confidence to walk into a room with somebody that's been doing this for a very long time and to present yourself as an expert. And that's a path as well. It takes a long time to work up that confidence. I went and uh, I went and did a podcast recently with an expert in my field and I giggled all the way through. <laughs> because <laughs> You know, like, so it's still, like, I'm still trying to develop that confidence. But I think knowing someone's work, knowing who they are, it makes it easier to talk to them and to disagree with them. So think about what you want going to say to them. Don't just say, oh, that's not right. That's not right. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, that, I'm against that. That's ideological. So that's the sociologist standing up in front of you. That's an ideological approach that it's like, oh, we shouldn't do that because... X, 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 you must look at the other side. You must look at why they've decided that that's the way to do it. And then you think, right, so if they think that, I think that too. So we've got common ground. So now let's have more of a uh, Venn diagram discussion <laughs> rather than an opposition discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah. I am of the machine. <laughs> and I suppose, you know, could you reflect on that change that you saw, what it was, and whether or not you think the academic game is worth it? I think it's worth it. I really like it. But as I... I love it. But I walk around in the several... years. So I've done sessional work at several universities. You can work out which ones they are. And um, based in southeast Queensland... And there are, <laughs> there are people walking around like they can't believe it's changed still. People are sad. They're grieving, basically. But I still believe in the work of academia. And I think while we spend time grieving it, 
the powers which are removing that power that we have in this very privileged uh, position where we're supposed to be setting the discourse is being taken away from us by other organisations. So I believe in academia in Australia. I'm going to say Australia because it's publicly funded. So it is in the... Well, most of the institutions are publicly funded. So it is in the public interest. It is intended to be neutral and we are supposed to have these disagreements in order to set the discourse for Australia, have robust discussions. But we are in a time where if people do not try and rescue it by basically saying, this is how it is, what can we do ethically the way it is now, we're going to lose it. And, I, you know, you just got to watch the Ramsey Centre being shopped around. We're going to... And the fact that we have two levels of explaining how we're in the national interest when we're putting in an ARC. So we're in the political party's interest as well as the national interest. I remember when I worked for Ed Queensland, everything we wrote was for the party's interest, not for education's interest. And this is something which is in these bureaucratic spaces that we need to stop in its tracks. And by being in the academy, I believe it's the last outpost of being able to do that. So I do believe in it. I understand what it is. I've had to shift my mentality in order to accept some things which are going on, absolutely. But the old academia, for want of a better word, is gone. And I think we've been through our grief. We need to understand that there's been a grieving process, but now we get on with life as life has changed. If that helps, that's my opinion. Others may have a different one. I haven't had a PhD candidate before, but <laughs> but um, in, a, in a special space, I watch um, a lot of the relationships I've forged on Twitter have been PhD students who just want somebody to talk to that's been there, and we talk, you know, like, and we have discussions not on the timeline, sometimes on the timeline, but usually in a more private space about those situations, and. Um, I, I do think that there just has to be... I think ECRs and PhD students can be the new leaders in understanding that this is how it works. I think there is a very... Well, at least at my university and a few others around, there's a very bottom-heavy academy where the, there is a lot of PH... There's a lot of HDR students due to the massification of the course. Um, so there's, like, 30 jobs for every 100 PhDs. There's a, um, uh, there's a large amount... Um, lecturer A's are becoming more and more... Like, teaching intensive lecturer A's are becoming more and more common. Lecturer B's, lecturer C's do the most at the bulk of the teaching and learning heavy lifting but are also expected to do the research. Then there also seems to be a little bit of a gap and I think that means that the ECRs just have to have the confidence. They just have to say, we have to be leaders about this. So people... But the wonderful thing about education is you've already been... A lot of you have already been principals and heads of department and deputies, so it's not in bad hands by giving the inexperienced leadership roles. At my university, most of the research leaders are senior lecturers. So it's like, like the heads of the research groups. And so it's, I think we have to acknowledge that this is where the academy is at at the moment, is the people who are less experienced are, being le are becoming leaders. But as I said, principals, deputies, heads of department, heads of curriculum are what, a well, are what quite a number of these people are. So they're quite used to being leaders of corporations. I think we've got time for one more, if anyone... Thank you very much.